Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Every class has a clown, the person who sits in the back and cracks jokes about the teacher or lightens the mood with a well-timed jab at the new kid. They're popular because they make people laugh. Well, maybe not the teachers. It's their humor and lack of respect that lands them in trouble. But a class clown only has detention to worry about. Back in the 15th and 16th centuries, though, insulting an authority figure could land you in jail. Or worse. Luckily for Nicholas Ferriol, he could talk his way out of anything. Ferial was also known as Le Fivrial, or Triboulet, and he was a jester, a performer who entertained kings and nobility with songs, dancing, magic tricks, and jokes. And though men were often employed as fools for the court, the occasional female jester was known to perform for the royals as well as their children. Jesters were more than entertainers, though. In some cases, when news was too grim to bear, it was the fool who would deliver it in such a way as to make it more palatable. It's unknown as to whether Triboulet ever gave the king bad news, but he was certainly no stranger to it himself. One time, Triboulet was performing for a crowd when he decided to pick on a particular nobleman during his routine. He told joke after joke at the man's expense, which got the nobleman heated, and he turned to Triboulet and threatened to kill him. The jester, frightened by the man's anger, ran to the king and explained the situation. The king told him not to worry, and that if the nobleman actually did kill him, he'd have him beheaded 15 minutes later. Triboulet then asked, would it be possible to behead him 15 minutes before? That wasn't the only time his wits got him into and out of a jam. During another performance, Triboulet lost control of himself and slapped the king on the rear, Incensed, the king spun around and told him that he would have him executed for such disrespect. Sometime later, after he had regained his composure, the king gave Triboulet the opportunity to redeem himself by coming up with an apology that was even more insulting than the smack on the bum. The jester thought for a moment and then responded, I'm so sorry, your majesty, that I didn't recognize you. I mistook you for the queen. And it worked, and Triboulet was spared an early death. The man's greatest strength was also his greatest weakness. He could not help himself from poking fun at the people who employed him. After all, it was kind of what he was hired to do. Unfortunately, like politics at Thanksgiving dinner, there were just some subjects not to be touched, no matter how tempting. In Triboulet's case, that subject was the queen. He had entertained French King Francis I for many years, and so he thought he could get away with cracking some jokes at the expense of the man's wife, even though Francis had expressly forbidden it. Not one to listen to authority, Triboulet did it anyway, and he was met with an order of execution, far more than just an idle threat this time. He was actually going to be killed. However, because of his years of service to the king, Francis allowed him to choose his preferred manner of death. Triboulet didn't waste any time. He invoked the names of two patron saints of insanity and asked that the king let him die of old age. Francis floored by his response, agreed, and had the jester banished from the realm instead. Triboulet died in 1536 at the age of 57. It wasn't exactly the old age that he hoped for, but still, not bad for a guy who slapped a king on the rear and lived to tell about it. Everyone has a side of themselves they won't let others see, a darkness or a strangeness that they'd rather keep to themselves. Sometimes they hide it to protect themselves from the harsh judgments of their friends or family, or they do it to shield their loved ones from something they might not understand. For young Helen, all that mattered was her reputation. Helen was born in the summer of 1866 in London. Her parents were wealthy, educated, and artistic, and they encouraged her to explore her outdoors. Helen spent a lot of time studying the animals on their property. 
She kept quite a few as pets, too, including mice, rabbits, bats, and even insects like butterflies, all of which lived in the house. It was a menagerie, but nobody minded as it provided an ideal learning environment for the budding biologist. In fact, her experience caring for and learning about animals allowed her to foster her own passion for art. She began sketching and painting the various critters that she was in charge of. Her love of animals and her penchant for journaling and drawing eventually led her to the sciences, namely botany and mycology, the latter being the study of fungi. Unlike many women of the Victorian age, she went to college and even wrote a treatise on germination of the spores of a particular fungus. Her male peers dismissed it as bunk, even though it was entirely correct. Helen only worked harder. Her sketches and paintings were manifestations for a desire for knowledge, not only of the exteriors of plants and fungi, but their interiors as well. In fact, with all living things, she had an innate desire to understand how they worked. What made them tick? With plants, it was a matter of plucking them from their stems and studying them in a lab. Animals proved more difficult, though, especially the living ones. At the time, euthanizing an animal to examine its anatomy was commonplace as part of scientific endeavors. Helen was never cruel and always gentle when performing such grim tasks. After all, she did care for these creatures. However, she also had a natural curiosity and was constantly fighting to be heard as a woman in a male-dominated field. As a result, she may have gotten a little carried away with her studies. For example, while babysitting her younger brother's pet bats, Helen found that she was unable to care for them properly, so she set one of them free. The other one she boiled and taxidermied to understand its bone structure. She had dozens of animals in her collection, too, such as dormice and rabbits, all of which seemed to be more than just exhibits to be studied. They were companions. Perhaps such fascinations went back to her childhood. Her parents, although loving and generous, had also sheltered her from other children for much of her upbringing. Too many germs and bad influences, they thought. Rather than send her to school, they brought private tutors, or governesses, into the house. The animals acted as surrogates for her friends, so in her mind they were almost like people. As she got older, Helen stopped drawing mushrooms and plants and started illustrating characters modeled on the animals she knew as a child. She started painting mice and bunnies for the family Christmas cards, which led her to getting hired as an illustrator of nursery rhyme books. Helen also traveled, spending her holidays in England's Lake District and as far as Scotland. However, no matter how old she got or how far she went, she always remained in contact with her former governesses. One of the women, Annie Carter Moore, eventually had a child of her own, but in 1893, he came down with scarlet fever. So Helen started sending him letters to help him pass the time while he was in bed and quarantined. Among the nice notes, she included the drawings of her little mice and rabbit characters. One such letter proved so popular, the boy's mother suggested Helen turn it into a story. So she did. She self-published it at first, just for her loved ones, but a vicar who had gotten his hands on it believed the book to be something special, something the rest of the world should get to enjoy. He helped Helen find a publisher for what they called The Bunny Book, and not long after, her main characters made their debut. Lopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. The tale of Peter Rabbit went on to become one of the best-selling children's books of all time, and Helen Beatrix Potter became a literary hero to millions of children around the world. Just don't tell them about the stuffed rabbits. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.